This is the 50th anniversary, as we discussed last night, of Bill Holmes' Northwest Coast Indian Art and Analysis of Form. Um, and the Bill Holmes Center has a publication series in conjunction with the University of Washington Press, and Nicole is here today. Thank you for your support of that, and Regan, who works closely with us. Um, and part of that 50th anniversary celebration of the Bill Holmes book, which has sold over 130,000 copies in the last 50 years, uh, wouldn't we all be amazed to write a book that sold that many copies? Um, is making a new edition, which is all in color. The photography is now in color. Uh, and most importantly for beginners and, and people who haven't met Northwest Coast art before, the diagrams are all in color. This is available in paperback from the University of Washington Press. But it is also available in a really lovely collector's edition. There are, it's a collector's edition of 200, although we're quickly getting towards the end of that. Um, it comes with this beautiful foil slip cover. It's a, only 200 will be produced, no more. They're all signed by Bill Holm, numbered, and each of them have original art by Bill in the end papers, which are not in the regular paperback edition. So uh, these are $200 a piece, $150 of that is tax deductible, and the proceeds go to the Bill Holmes Center publication series to support our future publications in art history um, and the books that allow us to put the kind of work that you've seen today out there into the world so that everybody can uh, share in that. So I want to introduce for this afternoon's session Bridget Johnson, who works with us in the Bill Holmes Center and has been um, an absolutely key player this whole year in uh, getting ready for the Here and Now exhibit and this symposium. I could not do this work without Bridget's help, um, so I would like you to help me thank her. Bridget is another one of uh, Robin's students. She finished her uh, MA just last spring studying Columbia River uh, Mountain Sheep Horn Bowls, and she is going to facilitate this afternoon's conversation with the artists. I have to say that I will be selling these at the back of the room <laughs> after this session. This is your chance to get one and pick it up in person and take it home. Please. <laughs> Hi, thank you, Katie. Hi, I am here to introduce our illustrious panel of contemporary artists. Uh, we have, as you can see, four wonderful artists from across the Northwest Coast who will be presenting. First, they will introduce themselves and present some of their work, about 10 minutes each, and then we'll have a moderated discussion and take some questions from the audience. Uh, first, we have, uh, or actually, yeah, first we have Joe Seymour, um, as you may have heard this morning, a Squaxin Island and Acoma Pueblo artist. And then we'll have Greg Robinson, a Chinookan artist, and followed by Luann Neal, a Kwakwakiwak artist and promoter. And finally, uh, De Kaheen Maynard, Clinket artist and an assistant professor of Native Arts at the University of Alaska Fairbanks and director of the University of Alaska Fairbanks Native Arts Center. Joe, please come and introduce yourself. Twa Gulapu, Gulapu Tadishan. Twa Gulapu, Gulapu Tadishan. Wahalatsu Titsta. Swaksin Abs Chas. Talal Sta Chas. Like I said earlier this morning, my name is Wahalatsu. I'm from Squaxin Island and uh, on my mother's side from the Pueblo of Acoma, and right now I currently live in Olympia. Um, uh, my father's side is Squaxin Island, so that's where I get the Squaxin blood from. And um, I moved up here in uh, 96 after I got out of the Marine Corps to um, become closer to my father's side of the family. And um, in 2003, uh, Squaxin Island uh, participate. well I, participated with Squaxin Island in my first canoe journey to Tulela. Um, that was my, my first um, close-up exposure to, the, um, to my culture, you know, with the drums and the paddles and the canoes. At that point, I didn't know any songs. Uh, I didn't have any regalia. I didn't have a drum or a paddle. Um, but I still was willing to participate in the paddle to Tulela. Um, and before that, that paddle, I was able to work with um, Andrea Wilber-Saigo. 
and uh, she um, helped our canoe family make paddles for the canoe journey. So that's how I learned how to make a paddle. Um, was 2003 with my with my with my cousin. And then after um, I got back home from canoe journey, I was able to get a hold of one of my other cousins, Pokey, who is uh, Quinault, lives out in, in Tahola, and uh, she taught me how to make drums. So you know. I didn't want to go on another canoe journey without being prepared, so I was able to, to make my own paddles and drums at that point. And, and that was the beginning of how, of how I started to make art. I really didn't consider it art at that time. I just considered it drum making and paddle making, you know, because I wasn't an artist. Um, at that point in my life, I was uh, working as a commercial diver with a company out of Kirkland, you know, doing work in Lake Washington, Lake Union, Salt Lake City. So. Um, at that point, yeah, I was, I was working marine construction, which is awesome, I love it. <laughs> um, yeah, I was, I was still harvesting, I was harvesting gooey ducks. I harvest gooey ducks for the Squaxin tribe. I've been doing that since 1997. And I love that too, oh my God, I love that. <laughs> um, and then um, through the longhouse at um, Evergreen State College, um, they brought in Preston Singletary to do a residency with glass making. And um, you know, the director of the Longhouse invited me to, to, to be a participant. And I had such a great time working with Preston that, uh, that I decided right then and there I wanted to be an artist. I called my boss up in Kirkland and I told him, I quit, I'm an artist now. <laughs> I haven't looked back since, love it. And um, you know, I was really fortunate to, to have you know, my, my carving teacher, Andrea, and um, you know, talking with Preston during this residency, he mentioned that he wanted to mentor um, more native, um, more native glass blowers. So I, I took him up on that. You know, I, I took a beginning glass blowing class in Tacoma. Um, we were able to go to uh, Hawaii together um, for the uh, Pico 2007 Indigenous Artist Gathering, and so I was able to work with him, you know, very closely for a week. And um, I was very grateful for that experience because you know he. He then, you know, became my mentor, and um, you know, it's it's you know through working with him and Andrea that I've been afforded the opportunities um, in my art career. So I'm very grateful for the work that they've been able to do with me. So, um, you know, we came here to talk about some of the work that we're currently doing. That's me. Should I see more? So that's if you want to write a check. <laughs> S U Y M O U R. Um, just tomorrow is the art market, so a little shameless self-promotion. Um, this is a paddle that I made on the uh, 2013 uh, Paddle to Quinault. This was a yellow cedar um, with a killer whale design. Um, you know, the great thing about this is um, when I, um, when we went to Quinault, we left from Squaxin Island, and I um, had the opportunity to skip her the Noked Jack, which was a canoe gifted to us um, by the Quinaults when we hosted in 2012. So I was very honored that I was able to take that canoe back to um, his homelands. Um, and then, um, you know, when I skippered the canoe, the Noked Jack, it didn't have a design. And I came up with the, uh, the Orca design when, uh, when I painted it and um, I donated it, this the paddle to the Potlatch Fund for their um, annual gala. And this is the drum that you saw me play this morning. Um, this is a 18 inch uh, elk hide drum and uh, it's a spindle whirl design, you know, which is a, a very common motif with uh, a lot of Coast Salish designs. Um, and the uh, images on there, um, take a guess. <laughs> Banana slugs, yes. Um, you know, through a little bit of light research, uh, some of the northern uh, coastal, northern California coastal tribes used to use them as food. So, good for them. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I, um, we, I grew up in New Mexico, and we'd come up here on vacation. Um, and I remember, you know, hanging around my grandmother's house in Tahola, and we'd go, you know, as kids do, go run around in the forest. So. Um, I'd never seen these before, so I was just totally fascinated with them. And all my cousins like to put salt on them, and I'd, I'd, you know, I'd always tackle them before they got to do that because um, I always thought they were just awesome looking because I never get to see banana slugs. Um, so, you know, that's, that's one of the reasons why I drew the banana slugs. I mean, a lot of people on Savory, eh, I like them. 
we can do. Um, this is a picture that I um, was able to take, and uh, you know, I, I, I commercially produce it. Um, of uh, this is canoe bows on Hat Island, with uh, my first canoe journey to Tulalip. Um, you know, on, on canoe journey, there's there were so many canoes that we you know, we wanted to wait for all the other canoes to catch up to us. So there was a, a soft landing point on Hat Island, which is across the water from Tulalip Bay. Um, and one of the things I was able to do was just I waded into the water just a little bit and held up a little disposable camera, and I, I just clicked it, and I didn't know what I was taking a picture of at that point. Um, but after talking to some photographers, you know, a lot of them are saying it's not the equipment, it's the, it's the person. And so I was really grateful that I got this image here. And um, I had the Sophia tone um, when, I, when I had it developed. And, um, you know, for me, it kind of gives it a timeless quality. You know, if you... You know, people are saying you, you can Photoshop out the speed boats or, or the motors. And I, I like leaving it the way it is just because um, even though there are some modern um, images, it still has that timeless quality that, you know, you see these old pictures of the, you know, the Seattle waterfront you know, in the turn of the 1900s, and, you know, all you see are canoe bows. So, you know, that's one of the things I love about this is that, um, you know, it, it, it takes me back, you know, or... Imagine, I can imagine what it was like to be, you know, you know just in the time, you know, when, you know, of 1900 Seattle, but yet this is still 2003 Tulalip. <clears throat> this sign, uh, this image here is um, our journey together. And um, this was uh, drawn up with the help of my teacher, Andrea. Um, in the uh, back of the canoe, you have a raven, you know, which is my clan. So, and he's, you know, Raven's always a, a trickster or joker. So that's what he's doing. He's uh, in the back of the canoe telling jokes. And, you know, you got Eagle doing uh, all the work with the, uh, keeping the, the beat with the drum. And then you have a Bear in the, in the bow just playing in the water like they do. And, um, you know, just sitting with my teacher, we were talking about an octopus I'd seen while I was diving. And so, you know, we're talking about this octopus and... You know, she's sketching out a design, and then I'm sketching out another design. So this is kind of a combination of uh, what we had came up with, and uh, we both thought it would fit really well on the canoe. So, um, yeah, we were able to uh, come up with this design. It took us about a month, and, um, you know, it's, it's what's really fun about this design is, um, you know, when you take a look at it and you call it Our Journey Together, it, um, and you put them all in the canoe, you got to realize that no matter where we are, no matter who we are, um, we're all in the same canoe, and we all have to work together if we're going to get anywhere. And you know that's one of the stories I love behind this is that um, you know there's you know four different representations, but yet you know we're, we all got to work together um, to to get somewhere or to do something. <clears throat> this is a um, a four-sided drum. And, um, you know, the, uh, the four-sided drums are kind of uncommon today. But um, a couple of years ago, a friend of mine had given me a, a cedar rim, a four-sided cedar rim. And, um, you know, I, because I had time to play with it, to, to figure out how to pull a four-sided drum, you know, I was able to come up with something that, uh, you know, sounded fairly nice. And um, I painted design onto the drum, and I, I gave my drum to my Uncle Phil, Phil Martin out in uh, Quinault, and then he told me, you know, growing up, that's all he saw were four-sided drums, and um, a couple of weeks later, I was um, hanging out with Lester Green from Nia Bay, and, you know, I, he, he saw my, you know, my drum that I had with me, and he, he said the same thing. When he was just a little kid, that's all he saw were the four-sided drums, um, and, uh, you know, talking with uh, my friend Roger Fernandez, he has a, um, a picture that he drew of, uh, you know, our, our Skokomish uncle, Sobier, in his longhouse. And um, the one thing I noticed behind Sobier on one of the posts is a four-sided drum just hanging up. So, uh, you know, that kind of helped reaffirm the, the fact that, you know, with the four-sided drums, I'm able to produce work that is, um, you know, uniquely... Well, not uniquely Coast Salish, but has strong Coast Salish roots. Um, this is a, acrylic on canvas. The uh, title is Rain. 
And uh, I think it's very indicative of uh, Coast Salish work that, um, you know, with the uh, shapes that we use, the trigon and the crescents. So, um, you know, even the, the negative space between the, uh, the raindrops, you know, is, it combines Coast Salish elements. And I just love that color, you know, the blue on the blue, you know, really cools me out. So there you go. That is some of the work that I'm producing today. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> <laughs> I'm uh, Greg A. Robinson, Naikanim. Ayumasi Puschagu Uksan. I'm thanking you for coming today. Uh, before I say too much, I want to acknowledge the Duwamish people whose land we are on today. And um, see if I can make this thing work. So I, I am a Chinookan artist and I work in uh, the Columbia River form, mostly the lower Columbia River form, but um, the form is similar all the way up and down the river. Uh, Chinookan, the Chinookan society stretches from the mouth of the Columbia River all the way up to the Dalles, so it's a huge uh, geographic area, also up and down each of the coasts. My family is from the lower mouth of the river around uh, current day Chinook, Washington and um, Bay Center in Willapa Bay, which was our wintering, uh, our wintering houses were in Willapa Bay. So my biggest challenge in producing this work, are, are, it's a very, let's say, obscure form and um, especially in comparison to Northern Form Line. I'm only one of a couple, two or three practicing artists, so the biggest challenge for me is just getting um, information about the art form out there, and I do that by producing it, and by also uh, teaching uh, Native youth, uh, mostly through the Grand Ron uh, tribe in Portland, Oregon. So let's see, what can I say about this piece? This was a paddle that was produced for, I believe for the Steinbruch uh, paddle show recently. And it shows a river serpent in human form. And the little people inside are people that he has consumed. And in the old stories, um, people who would flip over in a canoe in those dangerous spots in the river, those dark, dangerous places. Um, and then those people that drowned there, they were, it was blamed on these serpents and they were very powerful. And there were very few um, other entities strong enough to defeat them. Coyote was one of the few. And in the old stories, Coyote is the one that oftentimes goes down, gets eaten, and then kills the serpent from the inside out. But in this case, this serpent, um, I chose to represent its status. And I know I think I'm on the slate here to talk about status and rank. So in portraying Columbia River art, it's impossible to do without referencing the, high, the status and the hierarchy of uh, Chinookan society, which is a wealth-based society with, with ranks of status, you know, starting at the, the upper highest levels of rank all the way down to poverty, to third class and slavery rankings. And so everything in, in Chinookan society is categorized, uh, that, that status has its stamp on everything. So my work almost across the board references status of one form or another. So the, in this case, the, this is a high status uh, serpent who by wearing his headdress shows his, his elevated status. Um, it shows many of the Columbia River forms that I use. I use almost all the forms that you see are, are based on old artifacts and traditional carvings. And then I reference stories to put together my version of um, what that represents. Uh, this is a little panel that was produced for Steinbrook also in their show that they have running currently. 
and it shows, um, well, it references a, a real common character in many of our, in many tribe, tribal stories, and that is the stick people that live in the forest, and these are usually really small, dangerous monsters, more or less, that depending on the culture, even seeing one oftentimes results in your demise. But again, it shows a high status, it shows the Tai uh, uh, or the chief of the stick people. And at the top are, are just representatives of his subordinates, those little stick people. Again, it has a headdress that shows his status. Um, all the zigzags, the zigzags yeah, you're familiar with on the sheep horn bulls uh, are probably the most common um, element on Columbia River art. And so I use it constantly. Um, simple geometric shapes also, but this, the exposed ribs are on the majority of Chinookan pieces, which references the supernatural world, the land of the dead. And so when you see exposed ribs on pieces, it's a representation of a supernatural being and not a living human or a human representation. And then at the bottom, the, the circular figure face is a uh, human that's under the control of the stick people who are, have it in, in their handles, in their hands. Uh, this is a, an octopus comb. And there are no references that I've found yet to octopus in our old stories, but there's no question in my mind that they existed, and so I wanted to uh, show a version of some sort of an octopus reference, and I think Joe mentioned that world underneath the water that there, we have all these overlapping worlds, and so you have the land of the dead, which is across the great, the big river, and you have this, all the, the people that live in the sky, and, and all those creatures and people that live under the surface film of the water, and so this references those people, the, the faces behind the octopus are those people that live down in the water in their houses. Um, it's a combination of yellow cedar inlay with red cedar, well, it's yellow cedar inlay, yellow cedar overlay with red cedar inlay. So it's a bit complicated. Cecily Quintana from Quintana Galleries in Portland challenged me on a previous come to, try to do an inlay in the teeth so that's the only reason I have an inlay in the teeth is because <laughs> I was challenged. This was another small comb uh, pendant that I did, uh, which shows cedar, yellow cedar inlay and red cedar. And that's kind of where I take the contemporary move in my art is that I, I like to use all standard traditional materials, but I like to combine them in ways that weren't necessarily used for practical reasons in the old days. Yellow cedar and red cedar grow in different parts of the country, but because they're relatives, I've always liked the idea of putting them together, kind of like a brother and a sister who uh, don't get to see each other. So I've always liked that, and I do that a lot, but also for the obvious for the contrast that you see in the pieces. Um, this references the moon, moonlight, and so the moon is shining down on these people that are below it. This was a large panel that I just did for um, the Steinbrook Paddle Show, and this is a good example of the status ranking that I'm talking about. So all these pieces, everything, everything in our stories talks about for example, trees that want to be elevated in status. That's a lifelong goal for people, for animals, uh, for everything. And cedar is a very high status tree in it, and that was decided by Robin way back in the old stories. And, but cedar also wants to gain in status, and it can be done by being, being made into a canoe. So it goes from being that life of a cedar tree to now it has a new life as a, a canoe and its status has been elevated. And so that's what's happening here in a carving is that cedar 
when we talk about status and ranking, these pieces go up in status just because they've been carved and turned into a new life. So they're no longer a cedar tree, they are this new, this new entity. So this is Kosach Ila'i, that's the title, which it is the sky land or the sky earth. And at the top, at the highest status point is the sun and it has some nephrite jade inlay in its forehead just to attest to its great wealth and its power. And around it, on the ring, all those little faces around it are his sons, the sons' sons. Um, the next big face down is uh, the moon. And then you have um, a morning star or the north star. And then at the very bottom, you have Halley's Comet. All the little faces in the background are background stars. And depending on their configuration, it tests their status. There's one there with uh, double daggers. And there's one that has a serpent in his hand. That's a, sp a space serpent um, that he has control over. I don't know how well that picture shows. The, the very bottom, there is a background star that's holding two heads. And that is a star that has the power to throw down uh, shooting stars to earth, those people that have been uh, thrown out of the heavens. Um, and then there's the one with light, uh, night lightning and one with power staffs. And then the ones that are more or less undecorated are of lower ranking and lower status. And that's all I have. And so that's what I'm about and that's what I do in um, I also want to acknowledge Pat Courtney Gold, my fellow Chinookan here, one, a lady that I have a tremendous amount of respect for. So I'm going to raise my hands to you, and thank you all. Wow, I've never had a podium that I wasn't hidden right behind the whole time. So what I've said in my language of Kwakwala is is to introduce myself, Luan. Uh is my potlatch name. And I'm from the Mama Lilikla and the Kwagyu tribes, so that's two of them anyway, of two of the six. And um, also recognizing and thanking the Dumamash people for always making me feel so welcome in their territory. Can you just push the down arrow? Yep. Oh, aha. Uh -huh. So um, what I wanted to share was just, uh, I, I'm gonna go through these fairly quickly because I think I have about 25 slides or something like that. Couldn't decide. Um, this is actually my very first carving. And I started carving uh, at about age 13 when the junior high school in Victoria, BC uh, started to offer what ultimately became First Nations Studies 12 in our provincial curriculum. And uh, we used to joke about us uh, being the guinea pigs. I did not mind at all being the guinea pig for this program. What we actually had was a carving class, a native social studies class, and a language class. So um, we got to learn all three in concert with one another. And by the time I graduated from junior high school and went across town to the high school, um, I had a little bit of a hissy fit and negotiated with the principal there to go back to the junior high for at least half of my credits so that I could continue what I had started. Uh, George Hunt Jr. was one of my main teachers, and George um, actually used to bring in some of the old timers, Henry Hunt, um, Oscar Maddell P, um, uh, late Frank Nelson, and also new channel artist uh, Pat Amos were in our classroom teaching us throughout the year. I didn't stay with carving for very long because, Miguel, you weren't the only one. I had lots of boys telling me that girls aren't supposed to carve. And even back then, I remember thinking, I don't remember hearing, my mom never said that, but I just stopped anyway and carried on um, to, and switched to painting. Um, I felt like I really wanted to learn a lot more about design and of course Bill's book was, was 
the first book we all received. So I'm eternally grateful for, the, for Bill's work. Um, so I studied it, and I think I've read it about 18 times, I don't know. Um, but I've always gone back to that book and everything we learned from the old timers and from George in our classroom. So this was one of my first original paintings, and I was really trying to get a handle on how uh, secondary and tertiary designs worked with our basic form line. And it really twisted my mind around for a lot of years, so I spent a lot of years sketching and practicing. Um, this was the next design that I did um, as part of my studies at, at, uh, in this art class. And um, <coughs> so I think I was starting to get a little bit uh, better hang of it. Um, and uh, George just encouraged me to keep designing and keep painting. And he said uh, already, you know, my, my painting was becoming a lot smoother. And, um, I, and I was, seemed to be doing well in that. Um, not long after I left high school, I had somebody approach me to do a logo for a conference. And it was called Giving and Receiving. And that immediately made me think of um, uh, the giving of the salmon and the receiving of the blessings from sweetgrass, because I'd started to learn about some of the practices from other cultures. And the tree of life had always been central to what I understood to be important with our people, cedar tree, just as Greg mentioned. Um, so I did this design, and I had one of my friends scan. Uh, and this was in the really early days of scanners. Um, so he scanned some sweetgrass for me, and, and we turned it into this picture. And I think that was even before JPEGs existed or before I knew what a JPEG was. And, uh, and the conference goers loved it. And I thought, OK, I, I seem to be heading in the right direction. Um, and then um, I actually went off into the real world and got a real job for a bunch of years. And I worked for the federal government uh, in employment and training. And then I moved on to the provincial government to work in economic development and um, had one of those real jobs for a while. But the whole time I was there, it was driving me crazy working as a bureaucrat. So in the evenings, I'd actually go to work at 8.30, come home at 4.35 or 6, and then I'd pretty much stay up all night. I didn't get much sleep, and I still don't. Um, but I really wanted to continue practicing my art. So uh, this design finally came around. To, uh, it, it was sort of floating in the back of my mind for years. I wanted to do something that was really unique from what I'd been taught. And I'd been really trained a lot in some very, very northern styles of, of uh, ovoids and U-shapes. And I wanted to just kind of push the boundaries a little bit. So this became, uh, it's called Four Noble Women. And it actually represents my mom and my three sisters. And you can sort of see, there's the two faces over here. Um, this one in the back is wearing a black robe. This is my sister Joan and the dance that she received, which was the tukwid. Um, this one up front is, uh, represents um, my sister Sandra, who uh, is the Heliot Gerste, or the, the guide for my brother, who is a Hamatza, Kevin Kramer. And then my mom up front with a Sisu, oh, and this is why it's kind of in a Chilkit style, is because my brother is from the Cranmer family, uh, which is connected to the Hunt family. So he has the right to wear the Chilkit. Um, this double-headed serpent is here on my mum, and then on the other side is my sister Nora, who received the uh, ghost dance. So this was a limited edition print, my first print that I did in the year 2000, and after it sold out within three months, I got really scared. And I thought, oh no, I'm going to have to top that, and um, I almost didn't want to do any more art for a long time. Um, but my brother encouraged me to, to keep going, and he had actually continued on. We, we started at the same time. He continued on to become a professional carver. Um, and one day he asked me, he said, I, I really like the way you paint, and you seem to be practicing a lot on fabrics. I think that was all I could afford was, fab was scrap fabrics from the, um, the, what do you call those, the bins in the fabric store. So I paint on those, and uh, so he designed this chill kit and asked me to paint it for him. And that's his daughter, Gana'o, um, Alyssa. And she has actually a Mama Lilikla raven done in a Chilkit style. I quickly whipped these up for our potlatch in 2010 from the Newman family. My uncle is uh, Chief Edwin Newman from uh, Bella Bella. His name is Nulis. And he held a potlatch in 2010 to give us all of our uh, family our names, especially on the Neil side, uh, because 
as many have talked about today, the disruption of our potlatch meant that our family also had not potlatched in a great many years. I also quickly whip this up for the um, RCMP in, in Vancouver. They were going to do a, um, uh, an Aboriginal youth canoe journey uh, into the interior. And uh, it, they had never done this before. And so the sea seal, the double-headed serpent, is one of my family crests. And I thought, I really want those young people to be protected when they go out on these waters they've never been on. Um, so I created this very, what I call a very modern, stylized version of our sea seal. And this was some of the painting I was doing on fabrics. I made this for my auntie Biddy. Uh, her, real, uh, her English name is, is Teresa Neal. Um, but she really wanted a uh, chocolate style raven blouse to wear um, when we went to the to Edwin's potlatch. So um, I did this for her years before and touched it up just before the potlatch. I actually spent a lot of years doing button blankets, and I still do a lot of button blankets and textile work. Uh, created this one for Biddy's son Travis, who I, uh, who's become my brother. He, uh, him, and I uh, only got to meet when we were in our teenage years. Um, but since then, we've been working together on different art projects for, for quite a while now. And um, one thing I love about technology is these days, you can Google anything, right? So we, were, we ran out of buttons when we were getting ready for the potlatch. And we thought, oh, no, we can't go out there with bare stuff. So I said, you know, I've seen some beautiful old work in the museums where the old ladies used to do the bead work. We're not going to do that. But let's embroider. I've seen embroidered aprons that just really impressed me. So I went on YouTube and learned how to quickly embroider and created this. And uh, so some of my nieces also, I, I forwarded the link, and they learned how to embroider too. And I've created things like scarves. Uh, drums. I learned how to do some raven's tail and uh, also did a workshop in chilkit weaving just so I could be supportive of my brother and his children. And uh, in my most recent experiment, well, two things I've started in on the last few years is jewelry. Um, I created that, uh, including the chain, just to try it out and see. I really wanted one of those like Egyptian looking. You know what? Women design jewelry differently, right? We, we know what we want, so I wanted something really blingy. So I created that out of copper. This is um, kind of represents most of my, my jewelry line right now. I've got about five other designs I've started. And I actually, because I was doing a little too much of this, um, each piece was hand cut with, a, with the tiniest little jeweler saw you've ever seen, um, I ended up losing sensation in my fingertips for two weeks. And, and with carpal tunnel syndrome. So my doctor told me to stop doing this, and I said, no. <laughs> um, but my brother uh, was able to connect with a fellow who has a laser machine that cuts silver. So we started collaborating, and he now helps me by getting them all cut out, and then we share the duty of, of you know, all the sanding and doming and polishing. Um, and this one is one of my modern works um, it's actually two eagles, a male and a female, in balance. And I'm going to stop there. Quickly, 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 quickly. Oh, there. There. Hi, my name is Dave Kathleen Linder. I'm going to kind of quickly go through my slides. And I know I have way too many images, so I'm going to go fly through them. Um, and my introduction is kind of built into my presentation. Um, so first off, I wanted to say I grew up in two different places, one in Anchorage as an urban native experience, living in a kind of, um, um, you know, suburb community like this, and then also grew up in Fairbanks in a ver very rural area with a little cabin with no running water, no electricity. Um, my mom lived in Anchorage, my dad lived in Fairbanks, and so I've always lived kind of with these two very different um, different experiences. Um, this was our steam bath uh, that my dad built and my mom had, had made. My mother is uh, Tlingit and Nishka, and my father is um, uh, American hippie, and so I've always culturally identified myself as, as both Tlingit and, and, and hippie, I guess. <laughs> 
Um, so this is a pretty bad slide, but um, it was my first piece, and I, I did it in high school, I think I was 16 or 17, but it was the first time I really examined myself in terms of culture and where that comes from, and it's hard to see, but it's a self-portrait of myself, and it was overlaid onto a, a painting of a Tlingit mask behind it, so it's hard to see, but I have to explain it a little bit, but it really kind of created the framework for the work that I pursued basically for the rest of my life, kind of looking for my place within culture and how that exists. Um, when I left uh, Alaska, I went to study at the Institute of American Indian Arts, and while I was there, uh, my uncle Larry McNeil gave me his old 4x5 Pressman camera and kind of really developed this love of photography and image making for me. Um, and Larry is just an incredible photographer and artist himself, and everybody should know who he is. Um, and so I went out into the world and, you know, I hate to break the world, break things up into black and whites, but I always thought there was kind of two ways to use the camera, one to look out at the world and examine it, and the other way to turn inward and kind of do self-reflection with that. And so that's the way I always use the camera, kind of going around doing these, these portraits in different areas um, um, throughout the areas. And I'm going to kind of speed through a few of these things. Um, uh, after IIA, I went to the California College of Arts and Crafts in Oakland, and I think they've dropped the craft part from their name now. Um, but while there, I, uh, this is the work that was done kind of right afterwards, and I was doing these pieces thinking about Raven and, and my relationship to Raven and really liking him as a character as an artist because he's, you know, the trickster and creator of everything, but, because, but for his own selfish needs. And, um, really started thinking of myself really as Raven, you know, this trickster character as an artist and, you know, donning these wings onto myself and then in a very odd art accident, my wings were literally burned off of me and at that point I decided that, you know, Raven should not pretend, or K Killer Whale should not pretend to be Raven, so I, uh, um, but afterwards, um, well, this was a piece, some pieces I did right after that. I had, you know, a couple of surgeries with um, skin grafts and all of that stuff. And, and so my work was a little dark after that coming through there. Um, and, but was still thinking about Raven and did this piece for an exhibition called Post-Apocalyptic Tool Show. And um, I think of it as my first mask piece and was really kind of thinking of, well, after the apocalypse, I'd be wanting to talk to the creator and have questions for Raven about what happened and why things were going on. So this was my, 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 my mask piece for that. And so I had all these, these pieces that I guess were maybe not um, directly myself thinking about Raven, but questions to Raven. And so this is a piece entitled Reaching for Raven, um, looking for that. Um, I had a gallery for a while in New Mexico, and that didn't quite work out because I'm not a businessman, I'm an artist. Um, and returned to Alaska in 2000 and stumbled across this program at UAF, um, University of Alaska Fairbanks, the Native Arts Center, and there's Ron Sanungatuck in the center there who started the program in 1965, uh, really an incredible program. Um, Alvin Amison is right behind him. He's a person I studied with, another just fabulous artist from Alaska, uh, but really found this like home of just incredible artists that was like a secret. I didn't really know about it. And so I quickly um, enrolled into the program and you know I'd been doing all of the sculptural work and thought it was odd that maybe I was a Tlingit sculptor that never worked in wood and took on carving um, at that time and started developing these mask forms and thinking about masks. And, and so carving is part of my practice, but um, you know, I also come from a construction trades. Uh, well, I worked my way through college doing um, doing construction, working concrete and bridge work and things like that. And so the the, the materials, you know, I transformed these masks into different materials that I was commonly used in my construction trade training, like these uh, concrete pieces I did. Um, this is my performing the mask series, uh, thinking about how masks. I think somebody once mentioned, they'll say, yeah, like masks are meant to be worn and now they just live on the wall. And so I had to like at least perform it once before it was sent out into the world. And this is how I kind of ended displaying up these pieces with this strange loop that happened when the visitor came in to look where they were looking at the photo and then the mask was looking at them and it created this circular pattern of people looking at work, looking at mask, looking at them. Um, so my practice also, I do look quite a bit at um, traditional material culture, 
of the clinket, and so I've got a series of daggers here, and I think when I was here at the Burke, I looked at every dagger they had here, great collection, uh, very inspiring. Um, but the, I've got a collection of these, I did them um, um, for my brothers and myself, and I was thinking about, you know, coming from a warrior culture and what that means and where we come from. Um, and extended that form into different materials like this piece, which was called my weapon of oil piece, um, you know, looking at where we are in the world. And this was actually done quite a while ago when we just went to, when we first went to war. Um, and it's been years and years and is actually still relevant now, but um, it's a, a sumped glass with oil uh, laid into it. And I never really realized it, but it became a bit of a performance piece because as people came into the gallery, the first thing they did is touch it. And they had oil on their hands and kind of like that idea that, you know, we all have oil in our hands, right? I have a car, we heat our, heat our house with, uh, heating fuel um, up in Fairbanks. Um, this is a double-headed dagger piece. It's about six feet tall, concrete, steel, just again kind of using those materials that I was accustomed to in the construction trades, working on those. Um, when I was in my MFA program, I stumbled across this piece uh, that is in the Juneau, or the state, Alaska State Archives, uh, which are held in Juneau and found the title, didn't see the image, it was just the title, uh, the Tlingit Shaman, and I was like, oh, what's this? You know, I have to find this, it was just a tag. And, you know, our names are, are, are clan names. I'm just a, a, a caretaker of the name for right now. Uh, before me, Roy Brown um, was, was the caretaker, my great uncle. Um, and so I, you know, went and looked and found this image um, and found a number of these images with this person represented and started really examining the image and thinking about how odd it was with these different clan emblems and placed in one area and very much a contrived image in a studio setting and realizing that he is just as much of a prop as any of those other pieces in there. Um, and so taking myself, putting myself in there, reconstructing, you know, reclaiming the image, well, doing visual sovereignty without knowing what visual sovereignty is. And it's like, oh, I just reclaimed that image for myself. But putting myself in that same spot that he was, and also kind of examining where maybe I might fit into culture and in our cultural context. And, and you can see that in each of these images I scoured through the archives, he's identified as a different person. <laughs> so he's, I think it was used for sales at the time. I was like, oh yeah, now he's a chief, now he's a doctor, now he's, you know. The, um, and so examining that and, and but, but altering the image itself, you know, taking, using the, uh, the tools of my trade, like using the photograph or using the camera um, rather than the um, um, other instruments there. Um, so we have this very odd system in, in the U.S. on how we identify ourselves that's placed upon us. Um, so everybody that's native knows exactly how native they are because of the um, CIB system. They're the certificate of Indian blood, and this one's mine. Uh, so it says 3 16 Indian and 1 quarter Simshian, which really should be 3 16 Tlingit and 1 quarter Nishka. Uh, that's where I follow my, my area from. Um, and I like that it says, you know, that it cannot be altered, and I've altered it. <laughs> um, so I've got this very odd birthmark, right, that has uh, has my, my beard grow in in two different colors and becomes this visual uh, manifestation of my cultural heritage. And for years I harvested that material and really never knew what I was doing with it. And it kind of came up into this piece that was um, entitled 17th, 16th, my, you know, nativeness um, on there. And uh, I'm going to end with that one with time. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. I wish we had an hour for all of you. So because we only have so much time, I'm only going to ask one question, and then I will open it up to the audience, which I'm sure has lots of questions, and we can go back through. Uh, any of these images. Um, anyway, the theme of this panel that we are having today is actually contemporary Northwest Native art and how artists like yourselves acknowledge the preconceptions of what Northwest Native or Northwest Coast art is. So, in your experiences, 
how do contemporary indigenous artists like yourselves meet or confront such a diverse set of expectations for your artwork? And this can range from community uh, demands, uh, scholarly interest, or the desires from galleries uh, or collectors. So in your own experiences, how, how do you confront these types of demands? Anyone can go first. Well, one of the ways that I um, challenge the preconceived notions of Northwest art is, um, you know, given the location, um, you know, this is Coast Salish territory, but yet there's such a heavy influence from the northern areas and, uh, you know, with no disrespect to anybody from Southeast Alaska or from, you know, British Columbia. But, um, you know, the work that I, that I, that I do is Coast Salish. And um, when I first learned how to draw there was a heavy influence of um, Northwestern art because, yeah, because we had the Bill Home book. And, you know, like everybody, I, I read it and I reread it and I drew. Um, and uh, it wasn't until I actually studied, started studying the artifacts from Coast Salish territories that I, I got to have the feel of, um, uh, not, of something not having form line. So, um, you know, working with Andrea real, real close, you know, she, her, her work started out with heavy northern influence as well. Um, and now, um, you know, I'm getting away from, from the northern influence and, and developing a style that I feel is, is heavily rooted in Coast Salish tradition. Um, so, you know, working with the Bill Home Center has, has helped, helped me, um, you know, get away from those preconceived notions of, of totem poles and form line and uh, get back to crescents and house posts, so. Well, it's a little different for me because there aren't a lot of preconceived notions for <laughs> Chinook and culture. Um, I challenge it by first and foremost producing work and by getting work out into the public uh, creates a dialogue and then you can enter into some discussions about what Chinook and culture is in many ways, it's, it's not the most attractive Hollywood-style romanticized culture because it, there's a lot of, um, it's, it's a much like corporate society today where you have resource wealthy classes and you have poor classes all the way down to slavery classes. And these are all uncomfortable topics for people. When I was the project manager for a longhouse in Ridgefield, Washington, school groups were often come out there and it was a difficult thing because to, de to describe the status um, situation for, and ranking for Chinook and peoples it was difficult to go into that without talking about lower classes and about slavery. And if you even so much as uttered the word slavery, the teachers instantly became horrified. And and, but it, it, and I didn't dwell on that, and I didn't go too much into it. But so it's those conversations, I think, are the way that I um, challenge those. And then in my teaching uh, students, I, you know, I just try to get them to understand how to engage with people and to educate people. And that's the biggest challenge, really, for me, is less about preconceived notions and more about um, exposing people to this art form, which is so from such an enormous culture, yet widely, just horribly underrepresented. So, that's what I do. Um, um, you know, I went to art school, went to IAIA and the University of New Mexico and, and University of Alaska Fairbanks, and so I went through an art training program that was, um, you know, I guess always focused on contemporary practices, so I, I, I never felt like I was really challenging much. I was just trying to be honest with myself and create work that seemed to be relevant for who I was and my place and time. So I, I don't ever felt like I was challenging anything. I was just doing what I thought needed to be done. Um, I've always been involved in um, community education and uh, it just in different fronts. When I, when I worked in government, I used to do a lot of cross-cultural awareness training. So when I left government, um, somebody said that earlier today, that, oh, you, 
Joe, I quit my job. I sort of jumped the fence and ran. Um, and I, I went towards art school because what I realized was uh, education has always been a, uh, really important to me and, and to my grandparents and my, my mom. And um, I'd always dreamed of going to art school and I always dreamed of earning a degree. And I'm happy to report in three weeks' time I will complete my undergrad. And uh, <laughs> so, um, which of course has just made me want to go on to graduate studies. But what I really wanted to learn was, um, first of all, some of the challenges being a, a woman artist um, was really big. So I really appreciated the presentation earlier. It really just sparked my ex excitement again about having an all-women's exhibit. Um, there, there were, I didn't have any words to articulate what, what I was seeing, and I, I just didn't understand how to, how to let people know uh, how I felt about um, women always being pushed to the side, or women aren't allowed to carve, or those kinds of things, and also not being able to, I used to try and help my brother sell his work to the galleries, and that was really difficult early on because they had their standards, and just felt like there was this big gap between what, what my brother was producing and what they expected of him. So I really spent a lot of time in, in educating people, and my whole purpose for going to art school was not only to fulfill my own personal dreams, but to learn another language. And, um, and I got a chance to do that, and I feel like uh, that's why I want to go on to graduate studies now. I've learned something, and it really opened the door and opened me up to entirely new communities of discussion that, that I think are going to help all of us, just uh, going right back to this morning's presentation, work together. And uh, so I'm of that same view that the only way we're going to get anywhere in all of this is if we all contribute and work together. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to ask one more question. <laughs> what, in your opinion, are the limits or benefits, since we kind of discussed this earlier, the limits or benefits of innovative mediums or techniques or styles as opposed to maybe what how would ever we would define traditional or customary or older forms? Start, John. <laughs> well, you know, we live in a world where you know technology changes by the minute. Um, you know, and then you know what is what is traditional? You know, you know, before contact, you know, we didn't have beads, so there was no beading, um, and even still. Um, you know, carving tools were made out of, of jade, you know, versus steel. So now everybody today uses steel and uh, not a lot of stone carvers out there. So, you know, what is traditional? You know, a hundred years from now, you know, what we're doing, oh, you're carving by hand. Oh, that's so traditional. You know, I'm using 3D printer to, to print up these wood chipped of, of a house post. And, you know, it's just, what is it? What is traditional? And then, so it's always changing. And, um, you know, I was um, at UBC at the Doug Cramner um, exhibit, and, you know, he was talking about, you know, using chainsaws. And, you know, his, his uncle, uh, uh, you, know, look, you know, were kind of mad at him for using chainsaws, but, you know, this is what we have today. This is what we need, this is what we need to utilize, you know, to, to keep our culture alive. So, you know, I'm willing to work with what mediums we do have, um, you know, in order to keep Coast Salish culture alive. And, you know, working with Preston Singletary, you know, we, we work with glass, and, and you know, glass is timeless. You know, there's there's glass pieces from Roman times, mm -hmm. and so now, you know, I, I get to have these pieces that are, um, you know, have the possibility of being timeless, mm -hmm. and I'm you know very grateful for that. So, yeah, the label traditional is complicated and unfair in most ways, and different. You know, depends on who you ask. What what does traditional mean to each person? It varies from person to person. I don't believe there's ever a time in Chinookan history that you could say that the art form stopped and stayed mm -hmm. at one level. It's always moving with circumstance, you know, wealth and prosperity, hard times, stories change and new stories come in and, and so the form is always evolving. Um, as far as, I mean, so my practice is today, I, I try to stay somewhat traditional to the elements that make Columbia River art, Columbia River, but I'm not, don't feel bound to any specific way of producing that art. And I like to combine materials, like I said earlier, in ways that weren't combined in the past. 
And when I carved stone, stone was carved in the old days by a process called pecking. It was just hard stone <coughs> pounding away on a bit softer stone, one molecule of stone away at a time. And today we use grinders with diamond blades, but in effect it's doing exactly the same thing. It's just a diamond, which is a harder stone, hitting a softer stone. It's just doing it much more rapidly. So I, I just think the, the tag, traditional versus contemporary, I think everything is contemporary, and I think it's been contemporary every day that's progressed from the beginning. I would agree. I think, um, you know, the idea of, I, I think that, I would hope that my work exists within the tradition of Tlingit work, um, even though it might not follow the rules, uh, but that it can participate and be a part of an ongoing tradition. And same here. I, <laughs> I like the words, uh, if I'm going to talk about something from a past time, I might say it's, it's classical or, or conventional in its, in its form. But, but at the same time, I'm, I'm, I really appreciated the, the presentation last night um, when the artists were talking about learning those basic form line rules first. That it is what we, you know, as a Kwakwakiwak artist, that's what I'm trying to work from. That's the basic foundation I'm working from. So I am also a strong believer at the same time that in order to do this style of art, in order to innovate it in the first place, you have to understand it to begin with. So, you know, I don't call that traditional. I call the form this, this very rigorous, strict set of rules and practices that help you to gain the knowledge and the tools you need so that you can be innovative in your contemporary practice. And I remember some of uh, the old people used to say, uh, my great grandfather, Charlie James Yakudlas, um, he always talked about how he considered himself a contemporary artist. And he was late 1800s into the early 1900s, as did my grandmother, Ellen Neal, who carved totem poles. And you know, everyone goes on about that, you know, she was the only woman carver of her era. Well, um, as, as far as they knew. And so, but she was always innovating and she, she moved directly into the um, uh, commercial market and tourist markets in the uh, 40s and 50s. So um, I don't really differentiate between the two either. I like to talk about the, you know, the convention of creating form lines the way the old people used to and then innovating in, in contemporary styles now. Thank you. Thank you for giving us your perspective as artists on the discussion that we were having earlier. Um, so I'd like to take questions from the audience. And if anyone wants to refer to a specific image that you've already seen, just let me know and I'll go find it so that we can all look at that together. Um, yes, do we have the microphones, please? So I have a, I guess I have an observation more than a question, and that is that this kind of goes back to um, analysis of form and last night's discussion and the overarching ideas that bring us together today. And the observation um, also goes back to something that Luann just said. She talked about, unless you understand the form, you can't do it. But something that was always fundamental to Bill Holmes' teaching, in my experience, was that you can't actually understand unless you do it. And so there's been some discussion today about disrupting the boundaries, um, exclusionary practices of the academy. And I just want to celebrate something that has gone on for the last 50 years as a result of Bill's work and others who are in the room. And that is the boundary between art, study of art, and art history has really been dissolved by the kind of work that we're all talking about and exchanging today. The people in this room know that you can't talk about the thing or the subject without understanding the performance, the way that Mikhail talked about the relationship between the context and the subject. And the same thing goes for the performing of the work, the making of the art. We all can appreciate what the artists have been talking about today because many people in this room have also learned, whether we're artists or not, to try and know the materiality and what comes from within and who sees it and all of those aspects without which we wouldn't be where we are today. And I just wanted to thank Bill particularly for that legacy. So. Could I just ask Luann about that last image that you showed? <laughs> yeah. 
Can you talk about that for sure. a minute? <laughs> this is uh, Zunokwa, and she is my grad project. Um, I, part of my journey in the last four years is I learned about digital design. Um, one of the things I found about digital design in my own practice anyway, was that I actually now work twice as hard, twice as long, <laughs> because I actually still use pencil and paper for the original design. I always, I always go down to the water, create the design, and one day she popped up while I was sitting looking at the sunset, and I thought, wouldn't that be cool if I could do that in plexiglass? And then I learned how to digitize, and I created her, and what I wanted to do was something that was this, this, this idea around how Zunokwa, or some people were, were around me were calling her Sasquatch, and I said, this whole idea of this mythological being, and you sort of see her, and you kind of don't, and is she really there, and is she really 10 feet tall like I used to hear when I was a child? And so I created her two-dimensionally by creating digital, um, cut it out with laser, and then put all the pieces together so that from different angles, she kind of looks like she's there and she kind of doesn't. And when you look at her straight on, she's just a series of pieces of plexiglass and seems harmless enough until you see the basket on her back, which this is in, in the exhibit right now at Emily Carr. Um, bless you. <laughs> her basket is actually made from the flesh of the children she devoured. And I've got these little faces peeking out of the basket, looking horrified. And so people look at it and they, they kind of walk around and go, cool, cool, cool. <gasps> uh, so she only stands three feet tall. My original intention was to be able to project light through her and cast a shadow that was 10 feet tall so that you get this play between, am I really seeing a monster or is it just a shadow? Your imagination actually takes you a lot further into fear than you realize sometimes. So yeah, she's in the exhibit until April 6th at Emily Carr. Last night's presentation, uh, David Boxley mentioned, uh, alluded to the, the sheer numbers of practitioners of Northwest Coast Art, specifically in the North. On the other end of the spectrum, I want to really congratulate um, the Burke for bringing on a, an artist like Greg Robinson. Greg uh, being a Chinook artist, and you can probably count the number of practitioners of Chinookan art on 10 fingers and maybe have some fingers left over. Am I right, Greg? Uh, maybe right in there, maybe a few more, yeah. Well, some people like uh, Martin Oliver's uh, nephew, Tony Johnson, who are, who are working to uh, language with youth. Um, I think that it is a travesty that the that the people who preserve the lives of St. Meriwether Lewis and St. William Clark, that being the Chinookan tribe and nation, are currently not recognized as a, litig a, litig a legitimate tribe by the state of Washington or the federal government of the United States of America. It's, it's a shame. Uh, Greg, how is your artwork uh, shining a light on that effort to gain tribal recognition? Well, you have to understand first that there are Chinookan peoples all along the Columbia River. Um, there are uh, a number of Chinookan towns, what we would call towns or villages all over and when uh, after contact they all got split into different groups. Uh, the group I happened to belong to at the lower end of the mouth of the river, um, part of our confederation was terminated by the Oregon Termination Act, and those on the Washington side just ha simply had a treaty that was never ratified. Um, the state of Washington has no recognition process, so that's why the state of Washington doesn't recognize us. The federal government has gone back and forth with uh, recognition and then reversal and then we've had bills for um, uh, to restore through the Termination Act and all of that's still in process. I guess how my work affects that is simply to just draw some attention to the fact that Chinookan peoples are still in their culture 
Well, there are Chinook and people that are in uh, federal, federally recognized tribes, and so that I don't want to, I don't think it's fair to make it sound like um, I'm the only effort to s salvage the Chinook and um, effort. Uh, yeah, education is everything, and um, getting information out there is always a benefit, starting dialogues and, and just letting people know that there are still Chinooks that are speaking their language. My son is a fluent speaker and teaches our language. Uh, so the culture exists, it continues with or without recognition. Um, it's still here and as long as there are people practicing it within the culture, it's always going to continue. Greg and I are from the Columbia River area and um, I had a very difficult time trying to find someone to uh, help teach me and it turned out one of my main teachers was a non-Indian and she worked with a number of elders so that's how I got started. I didn't get started until I was 50 years old. That's how long it took for our tribe to finally get our act together because of the terrible downturns in our history. So my question to um, Greg, I understand what his tribe and what he has gone through, but my question is, um, do you have mentors or how did you learn? Did you learn by books? Um, um, well, I learned a number of different ways. I have studied every picture of every artifact that I can find and I still find them today because there are an awful lot of artifacts, both uh, stolen and acquired properly, or if, if there's such a thing, um, that are in private collections. So you, the only way you ever see a picture of them is when they pop up on an auction site. Mm -hmm. So I'm constantly scouring the auction sites, and I do find pieces that are, I've never seen before, and I'm always looking for new information uh, that, that can give me more freedom within uh, that art form, and I find them constantly. Um, as far as carving, I, I've always been an artist. I did a lot of wildlife art as a child and can always remember a canoe that was given to me. I was collecting a bunch of sand crabs. It might have been on Squaxin Island, actually. But um, I was collecting a bunch of sand crabs and an old carver uh, was sitting there on the beach carving this canoe and he traded me that canoe for those sand crabs if I would let him go. And that always stuck with me and um, that was kind of a seed that was planted and, but I haven't carved seriously since I was the project manager for the Plank House in Ridgefield. And um, that's when I really started into the Chinookan carving uh, and it continues to evolve as, as we all do. I just wanted to thank all of you for your, for your good words and your powerful work. And I think that you, you um, you didn't fall into any of the traps that I was talking about in my presentation. And it's a wonderful example of the difference between how artists are engaging with the times that we live in compared to some of the way that scholarship can trap the work in kind of these stagnant areas. And what I loved is that I feel like you're, the way that you talk about your work, because most of you teach as well, I can just see that you're incredibly empowering teachers because you're not policing the idea of right and wrong and authentic and not, but you're honoring your ancestors in a way that shows the power of their innovation and the power of your innovation with this incredibly complex and sophisticated and I keep using the word powerful foundation of ancestral teachings. So I just wanted to thank you, Sissam. Give a round of applause. So I just want to thank everyone for coming. If you would like uh, one of the collector's edition books, I'll be at the back. And I encourage you all to come to the Burke tomorrow for the Native Art Market from um, 10 till 4. If you haven't seen here and now, please come by and take a look. And we can celebrate the great work of contemporary artists and the generations that need to be acknowledged for all the artwork that they have put out there that is the reason that brings us all here together. So thank you for coming today.